will still go smooth. Uh, my name is Julia Isaacs, and I am one of the co-leads of the, um, okay, oops, can we have the slides at the beginning? Or you can go to the one that has the, the question. Great. So let's say hello in the chat. Please tell us what do you like to do in spring in Wisconsin? And share, if you like, your name, your location, your pronouns. And I'm particularly interested if it's your first time here. So let's say hello to each other in the chat while we're waiting for everyone to arrive. Oh, we have a lot of gardeners on this group. Listening for peepers. Oh, Janet leads a native plant sale. Bike riding. I'm sorry, I don't know what an but but both pay a gardening bed is. Jackie, do you want to say out loud? Bird watching, hearing sandhill cranes. Hiking in the mud, yeah, mud. Great. Oh, Maddie, glad you're moving here. Combining solar energy and plants, wonderful. Okay, well, um, people can continue introducing themselves in the chat and we will move on. Uh, next slide. So somebody said they like to hear sandhill cranes. Um, Tonight, I'm sharing in a photo of incoming cranes to help root us in the land and in this current season. I also want to remind us that people over the centuries have seen the arrival of cranes each spring, long, long before the European settlers arrived. I've learned that the word for crane in the Hopak language is peka, P-E-C-A, that's the language, of course, spoken by the Ho-Chunk people on whose ancestral lands I live here in Madison, Wisconsin. In learning that word, Peka, I also read there are only about 200 to 300 people um, who still speak the uh, Ho-Chunk language. There are, of course, many more Ho-Chunk people living here today, keeping their ties to this land, despite the fact that they were forced off the land and, and came back. Um, and But much of the language and culture was lost when the white settlers arrived. I do want to acknowledge I can't take credit for this photo. It's from my Facebook friend, Barbara Wertheim Houlihan, whose Facebook pages are full of beautiful bird photos. So let's just take two deep breaths. And in. and out and just arrive here. Now that we're here, let's go to the next slide. This is just our quick preview of the evening. It's pretty much similar, but tonight our, our, our main feature is to hear about regional planning and climate change. And after that talk, we will be um, hearing lots of sort of exciting updates with Earth Day and the election and lots of things happening in April. We do have some updates to share with you. And then when we're done with the main part of our session, we will have breakout sessions where we will be welcoming newcomers. Actually, are there any newcomers? Um, you wanna, if you wanna um, wave your hand, I'd be happy to say hello now. Um, but we'll also welcome you more formally at the end and you can meet with our engagement coordinator. And we'll have other breakouts, including a breakout with the speaker. 
So our speaker, I'm gonna introduce Steve Glass, who's the liaison from our Dane County Working Group to the um, CARPC, which is the Capital Area Regional Planning Commission. And our speaker is Steve Steinhoff of CARPC. Okay, Steve Glass. You're muted, so, Steve. Oh, and sh should I take down the slides now, Julia? Yes, I'm sorry. You should take down the slides because Steve Steinhoff's going to share his own slides. Okay. Sorry about the muting there. I'm really happy to introduce uh, Steve Steinhoff tonight. He serves as the agency director of the Capital Area Regional Planning Commission, or affectionately known as CARPSI. CARPSI develops and promotes regional plans, provides objective information, and supports local planning efforts in Dane County. CARPSI's planning region includes Dane County and the cities, towns, and villages with incorporated areas in Dane County. Steve brings extensive experience in planning, urban design, and community and economic development in the public and private sectors. Tonight, he will talk about how regional planning can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and foster community climate resilience. He will talk about how land use planning can address, but not necessarily solve the challenges of climate change. Steve will share priorities and strategies from a regional planning framework for Greater Madison's growth over the next 30 years. He will share ideas about what climate activists can do to influence land use in our communities. Uh, before I hand it off to Steve, uh, he will speak for about 20 minutes then there'll be about 10 minutes uh, for questions and answers. So if you have questions, put them in the chat and I will pick those or pose those uh, to Steve at the end of his talk. So Steve, uh, take it away. Well, thank you, Steve. And um, hello everyone, good evening. I'm really excited to talk to you tonight about uh, organization and regional planning and how that relates to climate change. Good to see some familiar faces. I see in there from, especially from the days of the, the Zig Farm when we worked on it. Um, so let me hopefully get this right and I'm sharing my screen. We did practice this. I, I will say that your uh, organization is very well organized uh, when it comes to these meetings and preparing for these presentations. You know, be pleased to know that uh, Julia went over my slides and worked with me to cut them in half, really. So uh, it'll be, uh, hopefully it'll go smoother and won't be as rushed. Um, so just I uh, did want to give a little bit of information about CARPC as you're known. Uh, I don't and always assume that people know who we are, often they don't. Um, so we are one of nine regional planning commissions in the state. Uh, our PCs are created when local governments petition the state to uh, take action and establish this new unit of government, independent unit of government, uh, through which local communities can work together to address challenges that go beyond their borders. So in that vein, we work with communities on regional plans. Uh, of the regional long range regional development framework that I'm going to focus on tonight. Also, the regional water quality plan and the water quality management planning program that we operate under contract with the Department of Natural Resources. We also work on other planning efforts, watershed planning, future urban development plans, and we assist communities in a range of planning. And uh, I See you hearing my cat in the background. I just uh, apologize in advance for that. Um, but, and then some of the things we don't do, uh, we are not a regulatory agency. RPCs are advisory under state law, so we don't regulate land use or establish ordinances or issue permits. Uh, we don't conduct uh, other types of planning, transportation, housing, economic development but we do uh, work collaboratively with those agencies. Just one second. Hey, I'm gonna close the door. Sorry, Kitty. <laughs> uh, the life of Zoom, right? Okay. 
So that's it, all I have to say about CARPSI. I did want to move on and set the stage for my presentation by referencing the Dane County Climate Action Plan that was uh, adopted in 2020. I would guess that many of you in these uh, listening to this are somewhat, at least somewhat familiar with this plan. Uh, and I may, mainly bring this slide up to highlight the, the transportation planning, transportation portion of the contribution to greenhouse gas emissions at 29%. And that is really the portion of CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions uh, that we seek to influence primarily through regional planning, development planning. And it, here are two of the policies in the Climate Action Plan that apply specifically to transportation emissions. One is to essentially get people to drive less, uh, so reduce the vehicle miles traveled or VMT. Uh, and they want us, the plan wants to see a total 15% reduction uh, in that over the, by 2050. But at the same time, recognizing that um, we also have to change the and clean the fuel source for vehicles from fossil fuels to uh, clean energy, in this case, electricity from renewal generated from renewable sources. So as it re uh, relates to regional growth and development, uh, I think maybe Steve froze. We started the futures and uh oh my. Might help if he turned his camera off. Uh, Steve, we're having troubles hearing you. Do you want to try turning your camera off? Uh, Steve, can you hear me? Uh, I think we just lost him. Well, not that I want to overstate my power, but I've had the kind of day where my basement is flooded. I sat down on the sofa to relax and do wordle and I, my cat had peed on the sofa. And so to have the Zoom not work is just, <laughs> just my day. Um, Steve, can you hear us? I wonder if we all turned off our videos, if that would help at all. Um, when he could, when he joins in again, we could try it. His cat did not like being left out of the room. I've direct messaged him, but- um, Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Might well, help if he tries to reconnect. Is he? Is that what he's trying to do? Maybe, maybe to um, exit and come back in. I think he got kicked out. Okay, so hopefully he'll come back in. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, yeah, we, we can hear you. you. Yes. All right. Well, let's try it again, shall we? 
not from the beginning, of course, but. Uh, and we decided to turn up, most of us turn off our cameras so that um, maybe that will help also with your bandwidth. The other thing we could try doing um, is maybe you could share the slides, Julia, or you could send them to me and I could share them. And then um, Steve could just advance, say advance. I'm not sure if that will help, but possibly. Yes, why don't I try that? Because uh, I don't hear anything from Steve. No. Are you still with us? I mean, the other thing we could do is we could do updates first, maybe. Updates first. Seems a little bit. Oh, did you get what you were looking for? Yep. There's Steve in the waiting room, so he's coming back in. Steve, I thought maybe I'd try to share your slides. Steve is, is kicked out of the meeting again, apparently. I think we should just go ahead and do some of our updates or announcements, and then okay. we can um, maybe get Steve back in. Okay. So and we maybe have him call in by phone. So Steve Glass, do you want to try to connect with him and tell him we're doing other things for a bit and see if he can connect? Yes, I will do that. Okay. So... Thanks everyone for your patience. We will get our speaker back, but we do have some exciting art collective updates that I wanna, that we'll do first if, if, um, if Diane can swing with things. Um, can, there we go. The next slide and the next slide. This is sort of some fun news. Hello, hi everybody, thanks. Um, Yes, so this is exciting. There's an exhibit beginning, officially starting tomorrow, in the Playhouse Gallery of the Overture Center, and the topic is democracy. So I've heard from someone who's already sort of got a preview. There's all sorts of art about um, voting rights and racial injustice and all sorts of things, and the Wisconsin um, 350 Wisconsin Art Collective has three of our videos that are included in the exhibit. So um, it's highlighted there, thanks to Julia. She put this on our slide for us and it goes through June 4th. So um, yeah, that's a fun thing to check out. So we're getting some nice um, PR from now. Great, next slide. Russ, we have more art collective announcements. Yeah, I've been working with uh, a lot of student uh, environmental groups at the UW, and we're putting together, I think, a really exciting uh, bunch of Fridays leading up to Earth Day. The theme of each of the weeks is written down there, uh, and they were having trouble getting the week of shelter, the concept of shelter covered. And so uh, I agreed that we would cover that one for the most part. So I'm looking for ideas. I think we're gonna go everywhere from shelter and home as a concept uh, on a meta scale of the planet being our home and uh, for us and all non-human life. And also uh, going to a micro scale where uh, shelter um, that is a challenge or non-existent for marginalized people uh, on campus and um, in the city of Madison. So um, we've got a lot of fun stuff happening um, here. It's gonna be in the East Campus Mall. Um, give me a, a call or a text if you'd like to know more, but they are, the students have been really happy with 350's support uh, of this event and the event that we had last year. 
So uh, it, it looks to be a really good time. We're gonna have lots of food. Uh, we've got one of the giant wheels that you maybe saw in the newsletter all rigged up on a stand and we're calling it the wheel of life and students are going to be adding a uh, little bits of it to um, kind of uh, exemplify their commitment to healing this wounded world we live in. So it's, it's going to be pretty fun. Great. Next slide. I guess I'm doing this one. Um, the potluck this Friday at Richard Jones's house on Winnebago Street is going to be primarily uh, focused on singing, although we're going to um, also have uh, professional videographers there, and we're going to be putting together a music video of a particular song that, we're, that we've done in support of uh, the water protectors up north fighting line five. Um, one really exciting little sidebar that I haven't told many people about, but I'll tell you all now, is that I asked a friend of mine who's I knew his daughter worked in Hollywood. I said, does your daughter know any famous people that could amplify and like our videos and like our, our stuff? And uh, he said, yeah, I'll have her talk to Leo DiCaprio and Ben Affleck. And I know Ben <laughs> Affleck has 2 million people that follow him. So it's kind of exciting if you come to this potluck. Um, you don't have to be in the videos, but we're going to be doing a lot of fun, a lot of fun stuff. Um, and then are you doing the next one or no? Uh, um, you already oh, yeah. did your, I think your five Fridays thing. Right. So gonna, oh, you, oh. you do the, the rally. Yeah. Okay. So then on Earth Day itself, um, at noon, the students are going to be rallying at Library Mall and uh, heading up State Street, uh, getting there probably, I would guess, around one, because they'll have a few speakers down at Library Mall. They're also bringing in speakers from around the country for these five Fridays leading up to Earth Day. Um, and if you know of any speaker for our shelter one, that would be great to know too. But um, heading up Library Mall, we've got a really fun project in the works uh, that involves uh, the giant wheels. And um, so we hope you'll, you'll come to that event as well. Next slide, because the students aren't the only ones planning things for Earth Day. Diane? Well, <clears throat> rumor has it that there is going to be something else happening um, at the Dane County Farmers Market on Earth Day, April 22nd in the morning. It will be probably 10 a.m., maybe 9.30. We're not, you know, those details will be worked out. Um, so... <clears throat> But don't be deceived by this photograph because I think there's something altogether different happening. This is what happens when the art collective hibernates over the winter. All these, all these things pop up. But um, we we would love to have anyone and everyone who's interested join us. We could use people for role street theater roles, banners, tabling, etc. So if you are interested, at least in, even in learning more about it, you could contact Russ or me. You see our emails there. We'll also be in a breakout session so people can, can ask about that. So I don't know. We'll see what happens that day. And I'll do the last bit is that we're not going to tell you what date or what place, but at places to be determined and not publicized, we will be doing bank actions. And if you want to know more, um, contact me. There's my email address. And I particularly want you to invite you to our virtual training on nonviolent direct action, which we're going to be holding on March 27th at 7 p.m. And I will join Diane, at, Seth and I, the lead of the Divest and Defund team, will join Diane and Russ in this breakout where we'll talk about all these actions where we can answer more questions. So Steve Steinhoff, I see you're back. Should, are you, can you say something? Yes, hi, uh, thanks. I, I changed places, uh, locations in my house and see if that would get closer to the internet router to see if that would Steve, help. Why don't I share my, why don't I share your slides for you? You just say next slide, would that be easier? Okay. Yeah, why don't, that'd be fine. Okay, um, let's see if I can do that. Okay, you are here. 
I was. I, and then I think uh, I think you could go to the next slide, actually. Ah, let's see if I can do that. Ah, <laughs> here we go. There we go. OK. Um, so I was talking about the, how we started off the process for creating this regional development framework. And the first step is really to create as much regional consensus as we can around what our priorities and goals and values are for growth of the region. And it, that effort was called a Greater Madison Vision, and it culminated in a regional survey where more than 9,000 people uh, reviewed alternative scenarios for growth and identified their top uh, ranked their, their priorities. And next slide, please. And the top two priorities that came out of, of the 16 different strategies that people ranked, the top ranked ones were uh, re more renewable energy and green infrastructure. And these really demonstrated the um, how important that, that addressing climate change was really the top priority across the region. Um, Next slide, please. And so CARPC took the those priorities um, and then translated them into goals and objectives for uh, how the region, the physical development of the region, uh, could take place in order to achieve those goal, those um, top priorities. Um, next slide, please. And so we we drew from the key priorities from the visioning process, uh, the ones addressing climate change, but also increasing access to jobs, housing, and services for all people, more of like an equity type of goal. And then the third was over broadly a conservation goal, conserving farmland, uh, natural water resources, and fiscal, meaning tax-based resources. Next slide. The, the regional development framework uh, has 11 objectives that more specifically identify the, the shorter term things that we want to accomplish to achieve those broad overarching goals. And I highlighted these three in the dashed lines because they most address our efforts to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by affecting how much people drive. Um, and that is by uh, through these more or less bringing people closer together and to desired destinations such as jobs and services um, and increasing uh, density and ensuring better connectivity. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> actually, could you advance to the next slide, please? So one of the top, uh, one of the key strategies, there's a few strategies that we put in the regional development framework to achieve these objectives. Um, one of them is to prior, prioritize growth in already developed areas. So maybe you've heard the term infill development or redevelopment. Uh, it's essentially to build uh, in areas that have, are already developed. You can see on this map here, the light gray area is the area as of 2020 that was in urban development already. And the darker gray hexagons overlaid on top of that are where we uh, project seeing new new development happen with more than 200,000 people anticipated over the next 30 years. Uh, you can see a lot of that growth is anticipated uh, in already developed areas. Next slide, please. Then a second key strategy is uh, growth in centers and corridors. So centers are concentrations of activities, housing, and where uh, where people live and work and shop and where there's cultural activities and they range in size and scale from a, from a metro center serving the whole region to smaller scale centers. And they're connected through vibrant corridors uh, to the extent possible that, that facilitate transit and other development along them. Next slide. Another, uh, the third key strategy for those objectives is to pl plan complete neighborhoods. So recognizing that not all growth is going to happen as infill or in already developed areas, um, or even in centers and corridors, um, when you have to adding 200,000 more people, it is going to entail some outward expansion of cities and villages. So we want to do that in the most, um, um, 
compact and walkable and transit friendly way possible that provide a wide range of housing choices uh, within a walkable format. And this is aerial view of Grandview Commons, which is on the sort of far, far, far east side of Madison that more that fairly well represents that type of neighborhood. Next slide, please. So I'm really just giving you a, a smattering of the information from the regional development framework and really focusing on those most related to the greenhouse gas. So you can see the, those three strategies I just covered uh, really address those objectives like increasing compact mixed walkable development. And a key indicator is the vehicle miles traveled. In other words, we're really, this is part of getting people to drive less um, and as such, to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions they're generating. And we're measuring that through total vehicle miles traveled. Next slide. So what does this mean in terms of how, of, of what this regional development framework can accomplish? What can we achieve through these types of, of land use and development changes alone um, in terms of affecting how much we drive. Well, we can reduce the amount uh, the average household is is driving on a daily basis, in this case, maybe 10%. Um, but when you're adding 200,000 people, not only are we not reducing them, the total vehicle miles traveled by 15% as called for in the Climate Action Plan, it's actually increasing the total mi uh, miles traveled. Um, so you know, it, it, it's tempting to say, well, that's okay. We can make up for that by just uh, people driving, switching cars to EVs that are powered by renewable energy. But uh, the reality is, A, that won't happen fast enough. Uh, and B, the model of everybody mostly getting around in in via in in single single vehicle single occupancy vehicles basically driving by themselves is not over, really a sustainable model for the future either. Um, really, so there's really need you need other things besides these land use changes. You need much more aggressive transit um, operations. Uh, for example, the bus rapid transit and extend, extending transit operations. And this is where I think, you know, 350 Madison can play uh, an important, 350 Wisconsin, sorry, can play an important role um, because governments aren't necessarily designed for bold and out of the box thinking or more incremental and um, Cautious in the in the type, in the approaches that we take, uh, but the the climate emergency calls for more bolder action. So, you know what what more can be done to design our streets to be uh, accommodate and and prioritize walking and biking and transit instead of single occupancy. You know how can we re, uh, change our parking policies so that we're not incentivizing car use. Um, so, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. Um, then the, the regional development framework also addresses climate resilience or climate adaptation by uh, in policies and actions to encourage tree planting, um, increase, uh, green, use more green infrastructure ways to uh, absorb more rainfall and snow melt where it falls instead of uh, reducing the amount that runs off into our streams and lakes, which causes more water pollution, um, and to uh, reduce surface temperatures and the uh, heat, the the uh, urban heat island effect. And this is a the tree planting and uh, preservation. I think is another way that 350 Madison uh, participants, people in your organization, you could. Have an, have an impact uh, through our work. It, it uh, initiated, helped instigate the creation of a regional tree canopy working group, which is a partnership between our organization and the Office of Energy, Dane County Office of Energy and Climate Change, as well as other local governments and, and stakeholders. Um, and so we've really experienced a significant loss of tree canopy over the last 15 years through um, in particular uh, disease emerald ash borers, but also through other measures of urbanization and 
Um, so we really need to ramp up and make big changes in, uh, in increasing our tree canopy. Uh, you know, as you know, that's not effect important not only from the standpoint of absorbing carbon dioxide, but they have multiple other benefits, uh, habitat, uh, quality of life, and including reducing cooling costs, which also reduces fossil fuel consumption. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just an example, quick uh, example of uh, the green infrastructure type of projects that we're involved in. We led this effort to uh, bring communities together and work with the state and federal agencies to uh, raise funds and develop a plan for uh, increasing green infrastructure in the Black Earth Creek watershed uh, that has been completed and now is uh, raising, we're ra helping to raise funds for uh, targeted implementation, uh, especially focusing on wetland restoration along the creek, which uh, if occurred done the way it's shown in the plan could measurably reduce flooding risk. Next slide. And um, I think near the end of the presentation now, we, in a, we are also, also again in partnership with the County Office of Energy and Climate Change, uh, working to achieve this regional designation from a national organization called Soul Smart, which, uh, which gives out gold, silver, bronze designation to local units of government as well as regional units. Um, and to achieve the designation, you have to uh, take actions to demonstrate that you are friendly and encouraging and welcoming of solar PV by through your permitting processes and your ordinances and your, your funding and promoting group buy and things like that. Uh, and this is another way that you could get help where you could help uh, promote, uh, encourage community, local communities to uh, also achieve this designation. Currently Madison and Fitchburg have, but we really wanna see uh, communities across the region seek this designation because it is a way that can really help promote ramp up solar PV. Um, and part of the reason we're doing this as a regional designation is in fact to get the local communities, encourage them to do it too. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, this is the last slide. Um, I think I covered a number of these, what you can do already. Um, so I don't need to go over them again. Uh, I will say one one more thing, I guess, on this note is that another way you could get involved is uh, local decision makers often face pushback from when they're when they're reviewing proposals for increased density and infill development, redevelopment, uh, and especially when it involves lower income, you know, affordable housing units. They they hear from they hear from their constituents that you know this will be bad. It'll be more traffic and crime and you know, many reasons, um, but they, so they need to hear from the other side of it, why this, why it's important to achieve these types of strategies that I laid out um, for not only to meet a broad range of housing and, and, and provide affordable housing, but also to provide walkable, transit-friendly uh, type walk um, and denser areas that where people can use, rely on cars less, travel shorter distances, uh, et cetera. So, you know, for example, working with a group like Thousand Friends of Wisconsin, maybe you do already, uh, who are often uh, leading the effort on these types of things. Um, so I guess that's it. Um, I think that, you know, see there are a lot of, seem to be a lot of questions in the chat, which I really wasn't reading. So I guess I'm leaving that to you, Julia. To... Yeah, thank you, Steve, very much. Uh, really informative talk. And I think you gave us several avenues for cooperation between CARPC and 350 Wisconsin and ways we can uh, be mutually beneficial. There are a lot of questions in the uh, chat and I am going to uh, give them to you. One question concerns the uh, CARPC goal of reducing vehicle miles traveled by 15% by 2050. Uh, it seems like a rather modest goal and probably won't uh, help us achieve our goal of cutting 
carbon emissions in half. So can CARPSI increase that uh, goal a little bit and would they be able to achieve it if they did? Yeah, first of all, a clarification that that is not CARPSI's goal. That's the Dane County's goal that's in the, in the climate action plan. Uh, and the combination of reducing uh, vehicle miles traveled by total vehicle miles traveled by 15% um, is combined with transitioning. They also have a goal for uh, achieving a certain saturation of electric vehicles. Um, and the combination of those actions uh, at, based on their modeling will re, uh, would reduce green, transportation greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, from the down to not not to zero, but to because there's still some other, you know, there's very transportation is one of the harder areas to achieve net zero carbon reductions. Um, but combined with uh, carbon offsets and sequestration would achieve net zero. Um, I would say that with by when you're adding 200,000 people and you at the same time want to reduce the total regions uh, vehicle miles traveled by 15%, that means you have to achieve a per person reduction of 37%. So you're, you're almost have each of us will have to drive like 40% less. And in a car dependence uh, framework of, of the way the region is designed, that's a, that's a very difficult thing to achieve as we showed by our by our modeling, even even looking at half of the growth being infill in, in our growth scenario, uh, that that doesn't get close to that. So it really does require, uh, you know, to cut our driving by almost forty percent. Uh, it does require much bolder actions. Okay, thank you. Another question, Steve. Uh, the questioner wants to know, how does CARPSI influence actual decisions and development work in and by the communities that implement CARPSI proposals? What carrots and sticks can CARPSI bring to bear? Yeah, that's an excellent question, because as you probably noted in my presentation, we are an advisory organization. Uh, we, and it is more the local communities that are the decision makers uh, through their through their comprehensive plans and their zoning ordinances and their subdivision ordinances. So our goal is to work closely and collaboratively with communities as they update their plans to incorporate these climate objectives into their plans. And that's another way that you at 350 Wisconsin could be involved is to make sure and uh, push these communities to be aggressive in their putting these climate goals into their comprehensive plans. Honestly, not many of them do. And some of them are, you'll still find even in Dane County, portions of Dane County, where the response is, oh, we, we can't talk about climate change in our comprehensive plan is too toxic. So, you know, you may be surprised to hear that, but that's still a reality in portions of Dane County. So, you know, you really, really need, these communities really need to be pushed. Uh, and CARPC, we're, we, we, we're, we'll work on that, but, you know, being pushed from the outside is important as well. Or find find your members who live in those communities to do the pushing. That's even better. Um, so we also are going to be work doing an analysis of the local zoning and subdivision ordinances and how they can be uh, reformed to better uh, require because that's really where the rules are placed. The comprehensive plan is a guide, but the rules are in those ordinances uh, in terms of you know where what types of land uses, what types of densities, uh, et cetera. Uh, so that's uh, we're working with, now there are six communities who are contributed financially to this code, code analysis project we're going to be doing. The, the, these, many communities do want, and are aggressive, I should say, cities like, communities like the city of Middleton and Fitchburg and Madison and Sun Prairie, and many others are aggressively working on these, but there are others that are not. So um, I hope that's an answer to your question. Yeah, we all need to pull together. Uh, a couple comments uh, regarding the tree canopy program from Mike Friend of the Dane County Working Group and from Tannis Matheson of the Climate Justice Team. Uh, both of those working groups and teams are involved in the Tree can Canopy Collaborative. Uh, in fact, the Climate Justice Team has a tree planting 
planned for Sun Prairie on April 15th. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, contact Tannis. That's great. Uh, another question for Steve. Uh, the questioner wants to know, can CARPSI do anything to prevent development that destroys forest or grasslands? Can they encourage solar panels on all new developments? Well, one of the, I guess, uh, okay, the first part of the question, <clears throat> one part of the regional development framework is to uh, seek to expand the protection of natural resources beyond those that are uh, legally protected. So, you know, floodplains and wetlands and streams and rivers and riparian areas uh, are legally protected from development. Um, but we're, we've identified areas beyond that we call stewardship areas where those are mapped. You can go on, on our site and you can see the map of where those are. And those, those are potentially restorable wetlands high quality woodlands. Um, it does not at this point include grasslands, but it also includes um, um, uh, floodplains that are go beyond the 100 year floodplain, but that are increasingly at risk of flooding. So in, encouraging communities to incorporate those stewardship areas into recognition in their, into their comprehensive plans and their ordinances um, the most new development happens on, on farmland, frankly, uh, the, at least the new development out that, it, that is not infill or redevelopment. Um, and that's one of the I, purposes of increasing infill and redevelopment is to reduce the amount that happens as outward growth. Um, I think the Soul Smart program would be a good way to encourage uh, have communities work to encourage solar panels on new developments um, through their ordinances and uh, by going through the sole smart process. That's something that they're required to look at, those types of policies. So I guess that'd be my answer to that. Okay. Yeah, um, we have just two more minutes. We want to end by 7.50. So I think this will be the final question, Steve, until we get to the breakout rooms at the end. Uh, but this question is, is there a pattern in the kind of resistance you get from rural communities to the CARPSI framework? Hmm. Um, maybe that person, the questioner was referring to my comments about, I guess the sort of not in my backyard type of resistance. Uh, I would say that if that's the case, that happens more in cities and especially the, more of the rural villages the uh, rural communities, like the unincorporated communities, um, you, you, you actually don't see a lot of, or you don't see very much development. Most of the communities have farmland preservation uh, uh, um, ordinances in place that, that minimize that. I don't, won't say it doesn't exist, but the kind of not in my backyard or NIMBY, uh, I think is common across the board. Um, you know, people don't like change, they, uh, and so they're, they're, they fear it, uh, so they, they fight it, um, and it's typically when, it, when, they may, when, they, when, a pro when a project is proposed near them, uh, say a three-story building or, you know, a three- to five-story building along a commercial corridor, but, but close to where they live, They'll show up and they'll and they'll encourage the plan commission to vote against it. Um, and I would say a lot of elected officials uh, are have standing their ground and 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 um, seek trying and working to approve these type of projects uh, to the extent they can. But when we go and talk to them, they tell us they they could use help with that. I don't know if that's answering the question or not, but. I think it did. I think it did. Thank you very much, Steve. This is the end of uh, the question and answer session. There are several questions that are in line that we will get to those in the breakout room. But for now, thank you very much. You've given a really great presentation. And I think given us a lot of uh, options for collaboration and partnership between CARPSI and 350 Wisconsin. So thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Julia. Well, thank you. Thank you, Steve and Steve. Um, 
Can we pull the slides back up? Because we have some more announcements. Um, I think the next one is about the not just Earth April's not just Earth Day, but as we know here in Wisconsin, we have a big election coming up. This is your cue, Terry. You might introduce yourself too, since I think you're still new to many of us. Our, our um, joining us as our political organizer. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Also, Nuiswan no, Shri Thunder. Hello, my name is Shri Thunder. Um, I am the new political organizer for Three for Two Wisconsin Action. Um, and <laughs> sorry, I couldn't make the first, or not the first, my first. It would have been <laughs> um, the last public meeting. Um, I was having some issues with internet. Um, but I'm glad I can be here tonight. Um, so I am from the Menominee Nation. Um, I grew up there, I went to um, school um, there and then off the res as well in Shano um, for high school. Um, but then I went down to UW-Madison to and I got my um, bachelor's in community and environmental sociology. Um, so I lived down there for two and a half years while I was finishing up that degree. Um, but now I'm back home. I live um, in Shawano, Wisconsin, which is like eight miles away from the Menominee Reservation. Um, so we wanted to come here tonight to um, do a sort of call to action um, with the public and some of our um volunteers and staff. So we are a month, well, less than a month away now from the spring election. Um, and so we're working hard to um, protect the climate, our democracy and um, our reproductive rights. And so while doing that, um, we are trying to connect with voters in a variety of ways. Um, so we are going to be doing some phone banking um, and we have dates set up for those already. Um, so from tomorrow until um, April 4th, so every Tuesday um, until up until election day, we're going to be doing some phone banking. Um, so we'll be starting tomorrow and um, we're hoping that we can still pull a couple of volunteers um, from this group here. Um, and we're gonna be phone banking from six to eight. And then um, we'll have a couple Saturday sessions. So Saturday, March 18th um, from 10 to 12. And then the Saturday, um, March 25th, again, from 10 to 12. Um, and then the Sunday before the election from two to four. Um, and then on election day, we're gonna do one last push and try to get people, um, remind people as they're, you know, maybe getting, getting ready for the day or getting lunch or something. We're gonna be doing that 11 to one. Um, Maddie just put the link um, to sign up for the phone banking in the chat. Um, so you can look there um, if you want to sign up. Otherwise, we did send out an email um, on Friday and it does have all the links as well. Um, if you're on the 350 list. Um, but the next um, the next thing we're going to be focusing on is the postcard writing. Um, so we're going to be handwriting postcards and sending them out to voters. Um, we already, we do have one session or one event um, on the calendar already. So that's March 18th from three to five and it's at Julie's house. Um, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so that one is planned. We have a couple more that we're trying to get um, on the calendar and we'll share that. Um, we can share that with this group or I could share it with Julie and she can send it out maybe um, when we get those on the calendar. Um, 
<clears throat> but so you can um, sign up to join one of the parties that is happening. In, those are in-person parties. Um, you can sign up to host your own in-person party. Um, and it can be for um, whoever wants to come, our volunteers, or it can be just like you and your family, friends. Um, and then you can also have the postcards delivered or sent to you or delivered if you're in Madison. Um, and then you can write them individually yourself. Um, and then we also are going to be doing some canvassing. So that's going to be closer to the election. Um, and we're going to just try to go um, to houses in Madison, um, Day County area. We're still still trying to figure out the exact area. But um, so that's going to be on March 26th, 11 to 2. And then another one on April 1st, 11 to 2. Um, so yeah, they're putting, um, <clears throat> links to forms and the website and the chat, um, so you can keep checking on those and you can sign up for those canvassing dates as well, um, with the links that are in the chat, so. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Cherie. John, did you mm -hmm. want to add something? I just wanted to give a big shout out of thanks for all the work that Cherie and our other uh, new volunteer, I mean, new staffer used to be a volunteer, uh, Maddie Loeffler are doing. They're really just jumping right in in a very dynamic environment. And I just, yeah, check out the website. There, there is something for everybody to volunteer for here. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's hard to um, overstate how important these, election, these elections are, This what the specifically even the, uh, the state Supreme Court election, but the uh, the more local elections as well. So thanks to all for your help. And if you have any questions, please be in touch with us. Thank you, John. Next slide. And thank yeah, this is exciting. I'm just looking forward to, to all of this. Uh, Stephanie, our fundraising director, development. Thank you, Julia. Hi, everyone. So I'm really excited to tell you about a webinar next week that I think will be very interesting to many of you. Um, this is a collaboration um, between 350 Wisconsin and Thousand Friends of Wisconsin and the Wisconsin Climate Table, um, focused on um, a toolkit that we've been developing to promote equity and climate action plan. Um, so we'll be introducing the toolkit um, it's primarily a guide for municipalities to encourage them to incorporate equity in their climate action plans and policies. Um, we collaborated with a group of nonprofits, including Elevate and Thousand of Friends and um, three, uh, Wisconsin um, Citizen Action, as well as the Wisconsin Local Government Climate Coalition. And the toolkit provides um, Wisconsin and US examples of communities that have incorporated equity into their plans and programs, a menu of strategies that communities can consider, um, an array of resources and funding opportunities, as well as stories of impact um, related to climate and energy burden and flooding from um, marginalized communities. Um, the toolkit is just being debuted now. It will be available on a website in the next couple of months. And then a follow-on phase will be the development of a toolkit that's geared towards advocates and community-based organizations. So this really dovetails very nicely with Steve's presentation tonight and some of the issues we talked about. Um, and I hope you'll consider attending. I'm going to go ahead and put um, a link to register in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. That sounds exciting. In our next slide, we'll find out what's going on in 350 Wisconsin around the issues of equity. Hello. I am Tanis Matisson. I am a member of the climate justice team. And I just wanted to give you all an update on where we are um, in terms of our 
Jedi cohort um, learning and planning process. So some of you, many of you are aware of this um, and are actually participating in this process. So thank you to those of you who've been spending your Tuesday mornings learning about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and we are going into uh, phase three of the process now. So we've had the six interactive workshops um, during the end of January and um, February. We attended, many of us, well, about 30 of us, as I said, participants attended um, these um, workshops that were led by August Ball, who we've contracted with um, uh, 4C, um, the consultant who's leading us and, and managing us um, through this process. It's a cohort process. There are four other organizations involved as well, which is kind of nice because we have back and forth with them as well on our um, at our Tuesday morning learning sessions. But these are the six workshops that we've um, had so far. And um, now we will be getting the results soon of the um, cultural assessment or survey, which many of you uh, participated in and uh, responded to. And thank you for that. And that was phase two. And um, so with that, we can go to the next slide, Julia. So phase three is the actually the plan development process. So um, you can see on here, there's still a lot of work to be done. Actually, uh, the whole plan will be created during the month of March. Um, so we're going to be, so the work group uh, who I should name, which is um, myself, Marion Friedel, Stephanie Robinson, um, John, Nikki, Diane Brokarsh, and Emily Park. I think I got everybody. So we will continue to meet on Tuesday mornings with August Ball throughout March. Um, and we will, as I mentioned, phase two, get the phase two results of our cultural assessment shortly. Then we will use those results from uh, that survey to choose two or three factors that we want to focus on to improve um, in terms of our justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion um, relationships and um, processes and practices at 350 Wisconsin. At that point, we will share those with the participants and get their input. If you are interested in being involved in the planning process, you could put your name in the email in the chat in your email, and I can include you in our outreach efforts. Um, or you could email me too. My I didn't put my um, email on this slide, but I'll put it in the chat. But um, after we decide on those two or three factors that we want to focus on, we share those with people, get input, then we will develop SMART goals. I think some of you are familiar with that acronym. Um, I always forget what it means, but it's achievable and... and um, goals. So actions to achieve our goals, basically. Um, and then we'll get input from the participants again. Um, once we have those SMART goals developed, then we will have a draft plan and we'll present that to our um, participant group. And then um, at the end of the month or in early April, we will present the um, plan to the entire or to the larger membership, maybe at one of these monthly member meetings. We're not sure yet. That has to be determined. Um, but so far, the process has been fabulous. Um, I have learned a lot personally. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the participants have also said that they've learned a lot at these workshops. Um, and with that, I think I'm done. Thank you so much, Tannis. Yeah. Okay. I think we have two, two or three announcements left. Emily Park, communic oops, go back. Oops, back. 
Okay. Yeah, um, this is just my uh, periodic call for volunteers. So as as John was saying earlier, there's something for everybody to do. Um, and maybe you're not the person who wants to be out in the front of the crowd or, you know, leading a rally, but there's still lots of stuff that we need help with behind the scenes. So if you are interested in writing, research, web design, um, social media, photography, any kind of that sort of behind the scenes stuff, then I think uh, the communication team, we call ourselves CAT, uh, would really love to have you on board as a volunteer. Um, so if any of those things sound like potentially interesting volunteer opportunities for you, please send me an email. Um, that's my email address right there on the slide. Um, and also a friendly reminder to everybody, um, please like, follow, and engage with our social media platforms. So we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I promise Twitter is back up and running after being down for a little bit today. Hmm. The, more, the more engagement we get, the more eyeballs we'll see our, our posts. So that would be great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Emily, for that and, and for all you do. Next slide, this is Phyllis with her. Hello. Hi, um, I'm Phyllis Hasbrook, co-lead of the Tar Sands team. And tonight we have the opportunity to influence the EPA, that's the Environmental Protection Agency, regarding coal ash, the toxic waste left over after burning coal in a power plant. It's usually just piled near the plant, often near rivers with predictable results. Uh, this map shows where many of uh, all of them are. Um, in 2008, a dike holding back coal ash at the Kingston power plant in Tennessee broke, creating devastation in the Clinch River and on 300 acres of land. And you can go to the next slide because it shows that, the before and after picture. Finally, in 2015, the EPA issued rules so that all coal ash created after that date would have to be put in licensed landfills. But what about all the pre-2015 coal ash? It was not covered by the new rule. The environmental law firm Earth Justice sued the EPA, which finally agreed that by this summer they would close this loophole. Earth Justice is now asking environmental groups to write in comments supporting the change so that EPA doesn't get tempted to backslide when the avalanche of utility comments comes in. And we have written that from 350 Wisconsin. We are not only supporting the EPA's new proposed rule, we want it improved. Here's a quote from 350 Wisconsin member, Peter Anderson, who drew, uh, who drew our attention to this issue. He's an expert on landfills and has been working against them for decades. Quote, also be aware that there is a second loophole in the rule that Earth Justice does not address, and I'm lobbying them to address next. Namely, that the, while the EPA does require toxic ash to be removed from open ash pits along rivers, it only requires that it be moved to landfills intended for household waste, legally called subtitle D landfills but not to landfills intended for toxic waste like coal ash called subtitle C landfills. Those subtitle D landfill, landfills are not even able to safely manage household waste, much less hazardous wastes. Thus right now, most of the toxic ash waste being moved to subtitle D landfills in the, in the US is being sent to two Republic Services sites in Alabama next to largely poor black communities, unquote. Today is the last day that we can put in comments. So that means 10.59 PM Central Time tonight. We have made a sample comment that I will put in the chat and the link to the form where you make your comment. Please copy the comment now as soon as I put it in and then click on the window to open the EPA form and then do it right after the meeting and you will be doing a great thing. So let me hit that thing and you will see it and you can copy it. Did, it, did I hit it yet? Let's see, it's hard to see. There you go. Thank you, Phyllis. I know we had some, some back and forth today that you put this together very quickly because this is, this is tonight. Um, Kel Kelly put the, the the link in in um, in so, but you you'll put it again with the comment. Let's take down this this picture, please. This this pollution. Yeah. I'll go on to the next slide. I mean, we have our volunteer of the month, Nikki. 
Yes, hello. So we would like to recognize today Tannis Matisson, who you heard from just before regarding our Jedi work. Um, yay, Tannis. So <laughs> just a little bit of background. Tannis started working with us in 2018, I believe. Uh, and just to tell you how fast our organization has expanded at the time, we didn't have a formal board. Uh, we had done everything with co-coordinators who were coordinating things. And uh, we had a posting up on the website mm -hmm. for additional co-coordinators because a lot of it had been run by one person, uh, namely Gail. <laughs> and um, she ended up applying, has been with us ever since, jumped in with both feet. Uh, and has been doing so much. Not only is she the vice president of the board when we did transition to a board structure, um, she also agreed to be interim board president while Gail was our political organizer in the fall uh, and serves on the executive and nominating committees. And besides all that, she also still facilitates our coordinating council meetings uh, and is one of the leads of our climate justice group and has been doing so much work lately to coordinate our Cream City cohort uh, and our Jedi work with Cream City. It's a super involved process. I mean, these have been extremely long meetings to really dive into everything about our organization and Jedi work. Uh, so it's taken a lot of time and effort to plan this. And Tannis has been instrumental in all of this. Uh, not only that, she's a pleasure to work with. She's super welcoming, very easy to talk to. Um, always looking for new resources to share with people and just a really all around fantastic person. So thank you so much, Tannis. We really, really appreciate you and everything that you have done and continue to do for 350 Wisconsin. You are a gigantic asset. I appreciate that, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're embarrassing, Tannis. She asked it is embarrassing. You have to take the picture exactly. down now. Go to the next slide, please. <laughs> but um, we do have one more slide, I think, after this. Um, just you may, if you're new, I do hope, welcome, welcome, welcome. You've heard about our climate justice team. You've heard about, I mean, our CAT team. If you want to learn more about our teams, I'm about to put in the chat and on the slides the names of all the different team leads. But you really just need one email address, which is Nikki, who just was speaking, who coordinates new volunteers and, and links them up to the team they want to join. Um, so um, let me, uh, I think we can stop the recording. I have like two more slides, but I don't think they need to be in the recording. Um, the two more slides are just to say about our